So the first thing, as always, is we pray with purpose and we try to leave everything else outside of the classroom. Om Namo Arihantanam Om Namo Siddhanam Om Namo Aryadhyanam Om Namo Vajayanam Namo Lue Savasahunam Eso Panchanamu Karo Sauva Pava Panasano Mangala Lancha Save Sing Paraman Have Mangalam Paraman Have Mangalam. Thanks for coming this week. Um, this will be a continuation of what we learned last year. Last year, of course, we learned over and over again that you are not your body, right? Your soul is different from your body. And everybody and everybody who's a Jain knows that. We have lots of ways of proving that to ourselves. Sometimes it's fasting, sometimes it's yoga, things like that. There's lots of ways to convince you that you are not your body. But here's one thing that they forget to mention is that, and something that a lot of people get wrong, myself included, is that you are not your thoughts. Okay, you are your soul, right? But your soul is not your thoughts. And by you, I mean your soul, um, not your brain. By you, I don't mean your brain, because your brain is part of your body. Thoughts arrive spontaneously in your conscious brain that originate from your subconscious brain. And neither you nor your conscious brain has anything to do with that origination. Okay? So as far as what we learn when we meditate, we learn to monitor our thoughts, right? And we learn to, uh, sometimes we learn to focus on our breath. And when a thought arrests us, we learn to let it go and bring our attention back to the breath, right? Well, if you've done that type of meditation, you realize that those thoughts, they seem to arrive based on other thoughts mainly, but a prime, a, a, the prime origination of the thoughts is the subconscious. If you are not your thoughts, then you cannot control your thoughts. Now, I know what you're thinking. Thimir, that's no, there's no way that could be. If I'm at work and I see a problem, I focus my mind and I think about the problem and I solve the problem. Therefore, I'm in control of my thoughts. I directed my thoughts. So there's, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, logically, I move from point A to point B to point C until the problem is solved. Well, that scenario that I described to you is about 1% right and 99% wrong. The only part of that that was true was the word focus. It's only that you paid attention to a particular trail of thought. Okay, in truth, between points A and point C, you thought about 10,000 different things. You thought about your wife, you thought about your, the email that just came through, you thought about what you're gonna make for dinner that day, you thought about the temperature in the room and whether you're hot or you're cold, you thought about your finger on the mouse, you thought about a bunch of different things that, weren't, that had nothing to do with A, nothing to do with B, and nothing to do with C. Um, in fact, that is the way, uh, what you did was you focused on thought. So you thought, of, um, the problem is A, for example, and then that suggested something in your brain about B. And what you did was, out of all those thoughts that I just described, you focused your attention on B. And then your subconscious brain uh, originated C and you focused your attention on C, okay? And you didn't give attention to any of the other things. And that's what meditation is, right? You pay attention to particular things and you don't pay attention to other things. So when I say you, that's you, the soul, in Jainism, right? And in, in, if you look at the scientific literature, it would say your consciousness, okay? Um, so all that, let's say you have a constellation of all these thoughts, all, 
all you did was you picked out A, you picked out B, and you picked out C. And then you told me, Thimmer, I solved the problem. I controlled my thoughts. You in no way had anything to do with the origination of any of those thoughts. The only thing you did was focus on A, B, and C. You picked them out out of the millions of things going on in your brain. And you told yourself you solved the problem. This is why, for example, a lot of times when you have a particular hard, particularly hard problem, you sleep on it and you wake up in the morning and you have the answer. Including if you have played an instrument, uh, you have a particularly tough passage, you keep on practicing for an hour or two, you don't know, you don't get it exactly right. You wake up in the morning and you try it again and you do it right then the first time. And if we want to look to science, remember, that's the way that neurons work. Okay? One neuron fires, and then every neuron that has anything to do with that neuron, since as far back as you can remember, fire as well, weakly or strongly, depending how close they are. Uh, that's what we call the cascade of neural activity. So when you tell me that you logic your way from A to C, it's true that there's a logical path there. And it's also true that your brain solved the problem. But it's not true that you controlled the thoughts that got you to your answer, that you originated those thoughts, that your consciousness or your soul originated those thoughts. The people that are good at solving problems are just good at paying attention to the relevant things. We all know people that are smarter or dumber or faster, think faster or think slower. What that is is not that what we call being good at thinking is just being good at paying attention. So all it is is a matter of signal to noise ratio. Not a matter, it's a matter of picking out what your subconscious already knows. It's not a matter of logicking your way from point A to point C, but a matter of decreasing all the other factors in your life. And that's why if you have things going on in your life, you can't focus on your work. Right? Hi. Hi, Tamir. Come on in. Doing all right? right? Doing well, thank you. Hi. Come on in. Anandeep Bhavan. Nice yeah. to meet you. So I thought I would attend today. I'm not going to be uh, the very compliant people. Oh, no problem. I'm to see what I can tell. So today we're talking about uh, you not being your thoughts. Okay? Jainism tell you, tells you you're your soul. Right. Uh, and not your body. And everybody here believes that you're not your body. But I'm trying to convince you today that you're not your thoughts. That thoughts arrive from the subconscious into your conscious spontaneously, and you just select which ones to pay attention to. And by you, I mean soul, right. and what science would call consciousness. Okay. So a matter of thinking is only a matter of paying attention. So that was quite a load to drop on you first thing Sunday morning. Any questions about that? We'll have it. <laughs> we'll have more questions on that. What about the creative? Creative thoughts, the, the thoughts that you never had before. That's from your subconscious as well? Those are from your subconscious. And it's about making connections where other people don't see connections. But, it's, but still, that's about paying attention, not about originating thoughts. Okay. So you become, so if you focus on focusing mm -hmm. on certain aspects, you become better at solving those problems. That's what you're saying. Right. That's right. The right. more you pay attention, hey, how's it going? You doing all right? You doing good? Thanks for coming. So today uh, we're focusing on you are not your thoughts. Okay, and by you I mean your soul. Um, so we always learn that you're not your body. Everybody here knows that in Jainism. That's what we all know. You're not your body. But you actually have no control over the origination of your thoughts, which occur in the subconscious brain. And then we are, the only thing we have is the ability to do is pay attention to which thoughts we um, want, to which thoughts we want to. Um, so let's perform an exercise together, okay? So pick an object in front of you or any object in the room and you fo focus on it. Okay, look at it and focus on it and allow your eyes to soak it in. Usually we experience that our mind is near our eyes or slightly above our eyes, near our head. But I want you to mentally take a step back. You're not your eyes. 
Okay, your eyes are mechanical things that send signals to your brain. You're not your brain. You're the, the only thing that you are, are the, is the thing that pays attention to the goings on in your brain. So take a step back, you're somewhere behind your eyes. Some people feel that in the throat, some people feel that in the back of the head. Whatever thoughts your brain thinks is just like your eyes. It's going, it's signals that will go there with or without you paying attention. You're somewhere behind that. Okay, remember this feeling and say, isn't it interesting? My eyes are doing this, my brain is thinking this, but I can choose not to pay attention to it. I can choose not to worry about what my brain is thinking and I can choose to let it go just like we do in meditation. So remember that, this feeling and try to bring it back into your life as much as you can when you're talking with somebody, when you're looking at something, when you're looking at your computer. The shorthand you can say to yourself is you step back from your eyes. Okay, did anybody have a, have a feeling like that, like I described? You can, you can definitely feel that when you say that this is all mechanical, right? Right. Yeah, so you do definitely can go back and see the difference. Uh, not fully, not clearly yet, but you could see that. Mm -hmm. What I see is not what I see. It's just another process that you're looking at it. Right. So You, you probably, do, that, though, probably do it transiently, mm -hmm. but you probably have to practice, practice to often to actually get good at it. Right. Because you revert back to your own original behaviors, right? Right. But I'm looking at this, I'm like, what is my eye doing? Right. Oh, my eye's really close to my brain. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> right. You know, so I, I think consciously you have to practice. That's right. So just like meditation, the more you practice, uh, the more you get good at it. Um, okay, so questions about what we talked about. So what good could it be to know that you're not your thoughts. How will that help you? You don't have to follow a thought if it's not necessarily a good thought. You can say, this is not my own thought. This right. is something that's just there, I can ignore it. Right, exactly, exactly. So let's say you have violent thoughts or thoughts that you know it's long-term is bad for you. Well. If you understand that you are not your thoughts, you don't have to act on them. Uh, you don't have to be the person that is enslaved by his thoughts. And um, so, so that's a, a different kind of way of talking about it. I, we can talk about that. At, I can give you kind of like an emotional plea. Some people uh, really respond to that. So last year we talked about your emotions enslave you, right? Well, I am telling you that your thoughts also enslave you. It should come as a tremendous relief to all of us, and it did to me, to know that I am not my thoughts. Okay, you can step back from the chaos of the thoughts that are circling around in your brain all the time. Because most people don't even know that they can choose not to think their thoughts. Um, you can visualize what is going on in your brain as happening to something else, to someone else. Because it is. You are not your brain, you are not your thoughts. They are happening within your body, which is not you. You can release yourself from the responsibility of your thoughts. Okay, you know how much guilt we feel just about thinking. Just about thinking about what we did in the past. Thinking about how our life is going. Thinking about the way we treat other people, such as our wife and our children and our family we experience a tremendous amount of guilt doing that. You can cause suffering doing no actions in your entire life. You can cause yourself suffering just from your thoughts. And I am telling you that you can release yourself from that. You're not responsible for the contents of your thought because they originate in your subconscious. But you are responsible for monitoring your thoughts. Which thoughts you pay attention to and which thoughts you let go. And that task is much easier than being responsible for the contents of your thought. When you have a thought like if you're passing somebody on a bridge and you think, oh, I want to push them off, just laugh at it. You're not be you, you can laugh at it. You can say, ha ha, my brain is trying to trick me and fool me into doing something I don't want to do. You know how much easier that is than saying, what kind of person am I? 
that wants to push this person off the bridge just because I see him standing there like an animal, like a cat with a toy or something like that. And you can think about it all day. You can think about what does that say about me? What does that say about how I was raised? What does that say about how sh I should behave and how... Imagine if you did that, and we all do that to a greater or lesser extent with things that we do. We feel guilty about the things we can't provide for our kids, for our family. We feel guilty about, we all do that. I am telling you, you can laugh at those things. Because they are not you, and they don't say anything about you. Remember that what you think in your brain is influenced by your karma. Because your karma obscures your soul. And you can say... That's my karma talking, you know, it, it, I didn't originate that thought. And you can laugh at it. And you know you won't act on it because you have control of which thoughts you pay attention to. I'm telling you, that's power. That's power over yourself. When you can, you have power over your actions. Nobody is going to push that person. But when you release yourself from the thoughts that you, the responsibility for the thoughts that you have, that is real self-mastery. That is how uh, people can survive in prisons for so long. That is how people can meditate for so long. That is how people can sit in one position for so long. That is real self-mastery. So the shorthand to remind you to get there is that you let your thoughts think themselves. Your brain is going to think itself. It's going to follow different trails of thoughts and you let it go. If it does that, great. If it doesn't do that, great. But you let, those, uh, you let those things go. Now, an important thing to, to know is kind of what we're talking about, okay? So we're talking about the soul, which is trapped within our body. And then there's karma obscuring the soul. And so your brain and your thoughts and your subconscious and your uh, uh, conscious, conscious brain uh, are within that body portion, right? But remember, there is a direct communication between uh, your soul and your brain at some point, but it's very weak. I, I don't know if any of us have experienced that. I couldn't say that I've experienced that, but uh, the, the book tells us that it's there. Um, okay, so one thing that I didn't mention, oh, first questions about that. Or comments. I have a question. You, yes. Of course, you said the karma clouds your soul or uh, right so the karma you, obscures, right, obscures the property of, right. of your soul so which is infinite you, wisdom right, infinite right. bliss infinite happiness so if you have bad karma you're going to get mad, bad more subconscious thoughts correct absolutely but and you will have less an ability to control to them. control them right mm -hmm. okay so that's what i was trying to get how you i mean you're saying you try to ignore your thoughts but if you that doesn't solve, previous, the, problem. That doesn't right. solve the problem that's patching the problem. Right, exactly. You solve the karma problem, right. then you solve the whole problem. Right, that's what I'm saying, exactly. But say from a previous life you have bad karma, you have bad mm -hmm. thoughts now in this life, mm -hmm. how do you prevent, a, say, somebody in that, uh, who's in that situation prevents the bad thoughts from acting on those bad thoughts? Tell them to start doing thoughts. Start doing meditation. Yeah. Start doing, <laughs> start doing near right? Yeah. And um, remember, uh, we can do near to, to burn bad karma so they don't come to fruition. Right, that's true. So starting to do nirjara will put that person on the path to recognizing that they have control over okay, their thoughts. Awesome. Okay. But I think this thing is very powerful, like you said. The karma, what we had, what we did, we are not going to be able to get away from it. Having this, this in mind, what you the best you can do is not create more karma. Right. right. So having this power, I mean, this think a thought process will kind of let you get away with doing additional karma. Yeah. So one thing I didn't mention in this whole thing is the word mind. Okay, because that will confuse everything as far as the religious side and the science side. Because in science we say that Somehow your brain's thinking has formed this structure called a mind and those minds that mind thinks thoughts Okay, and then that's what they call The so-called problem of consciousness, right? Is how does consciousness arise from the matter that is within our bodies? Okay um, And so that kind of will muddy up the waters for you a little bit um, we're talking about and 
talking about Jainism, we're talking about you, which is your consciousness, which is a manifestation of your soul. Okay, so it's the thing that pays attention, which science calls consciousness or the mind, is what we call the soul. <coughs> Questions on that? <laughs> so, I guess trying to focus on the on the right thoughts, right, versus not focusing on the on the other thoughts. That's a complicated scenario to try to just avoid or let go, or you know or fo re reshift focus, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be complicated. Well, I mean, you're right, it doesn't have to be complicated. That's I, I agree with that, but it is complicated, right? Because <laughs> we, we make it complicated, right? Right. So what's, a, what's, a, what's the easiest way to do that? The easiest way to do that is practice mindfulness. And that was a theme of our class That's last right. year, and that will be a theme and I hope to make it a theme of your life <laughs> because that is the one thing that will, it's the tool that will allow you to realize the other truths. Is if you can see reality clearly and see the water that we're swimming in. Most people don't know that they're enslaved by their thoughts. Most people walking around are buffeted, you know, back and forth. You know how we talk about we're enslaved by our emotions, it's driving us this way and that way, our passions are making us do these things and that things. Well, you thought their thoughts are doing their same things. They think their thoughts are themselves and they may be able to gain control of that, but if they have impulses, they blame it on their brain, they say, I'm just that way. The most kind of powerful thing somebody told me is that what you call your life is a story that you have pieced together that happened to this body. And we call that story, that's my life. Well, that has nothing to do with reality. That has nothing to do with you. That has nothing to, it's just the things that happen to this body. Okay, so when you start to realize that you are not your thoughts, and that it's just a part of your body that you can choose to pay attention to or not choose to pay attention to, then you can choose to pay attention to um, the fact that you shouldn't eat this and you should eat that. You can choose to pay attention to, I know that exercise is important to me, I'm gonna make time to do it, I'm gonna do it right now as much as I can. You can choose to pay attention to, I'm not gonna let go, I'm gonna let go of these grudges, I'm gonna try again with my family, I'm going to start over again and start at zero. You can say, you can choose to say, I realize I lost my patience. I'm going to forgive. Uh, I'm going to ask for forgiveness for someone, and I'm going to try, try to start again. You can choose to say, I realize that I'm not my body. My body is sending these, in my brain, these signals that I need a smoke. And as soon as I reach for it, I realize that I wasn't thinking about that reaching, and I can choose to pull my hand back from that cigarette. You can choose. You once you. Once you start realizing that you are not your thoughts, you can start letting go of the thoughts that are not in your long-term best interest, and not in the long-term best, best interest of your soul. Right? So, we have an update as far as meditation. How's the meditation going? <laughs> um, you know, summer I, was vacation. <laughs> I chose to take the, the vacation <laughs> route. <laughs> that was my long-term medication, uh, meditation. No, I did it um, when I was coming to class. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. in, in my particular case, you know, I, I have so many different calls throughout the year that it's hard for me to be consistent. Right. So I'm struggling with that part. Right. Um, but one way I thought I could do it, get around it, is doing it at nighttime. But with the kids getting older and you know, so many more responsibilities in life, it's hard for me to uh, have the energy to do it at night at a consistent basis. So I think I failed. So my kids are young. I thought I would get more time when the kids got older because they right. would play by themselves or they too. would do their homework. Yeah, is that not true? Or? 
Because I'm doing course. everything with them, and I got five minutes yesterday when they actually, they're five and two. Right. They actually played with each other in their room, and right. we were both downstairs, and I was like, wow. <laughs> Mike, is this going to happen more? But you said no. No, it doesn't, for some what, reason. So what are you busy with your kids with? I thought I could let them go a little bit. You know, when they're, like, a little bit younger, you have a more regimented, you know, like, they go to bed at this certain time, they do this. But with their interests growing and things that they want to do and play, you know, people they want to play with and outside, you know, activities, uh, it uh, it just piles up. It piles up. Okay, so I'm not gonna get more time. (laughs) Just 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 wait until like another probably what she's two, uh, sixteen years years. (laughs) when she goes to college. (laughs) Then you'll be set. (laughs) Then all you have to worry about is the mindfulness of your credit card bill. You know. But well, I have done it on occasion, you know, especially at times when I have, you know, stress or yeah. um, an emotional day or something like uh, it does help in those times. And that's the thing that kills me. I'm in your boat, right? And I realize the importance of all of these and I realize how good it is for me, just like exercise. When we're done with exercise, we realize how good we feel and oh, we, it didn't use up a lot of energy. We actually gained a little bit of energy after burning all that thing, but it's still so hard to do. Right. I know it's good for me. I know there are these benefits. I know that there's this. I know I'll feel better. I know I'll do this. But it's so hard to do because of everything that we're used to doing. Right. So we got to try to make it a habit. That's all I have for you today. Any other discussions or comments or questions? So we're a little bit early. So this summer. Uh, me and my wife, we forcefully went to, I don't know if anybody has attended Art of Living, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, Mindfulness mm-hmm. uh, Happiness Program for three days. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what we did. Mm-hmm. And it was a life-changing event for us. That's great. It, it was. Uh, we do practice that 25 minutes every day in the morning. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's school starts and now the schedule will have to be changed. But in right. the summer, it was really good. Mm-hmm. We do see the difference, uh, clear thoughts, uh, very, now this will, will make it even more difficult, probably it will make it more <laughs> even clear, I hope, or at least we'll pick and choose better. Right. But uh, but it, it does help meditation helps tremendously. Mm-hmm. Um, and we try it in the evenings and the nights, Right. but the morning, uh, That's the you preferred cannot be time, that. Right? It's Nine always o'clock. preferred time where your mind is, uh, you know, out of the bed, you have, just the dreams right. that you could literally clearly see those things, uh, what you dream about. Mm-hmm. You could actually make a log of it if you want. And uh, we do see a uh, difference in our professional life, uh, mm-hmm. the thought process. Even kids see the difference in us too. Mm-hmm. Like you don't shout as much or you don't. Not you as don't, angry. You don't <laughs> have, yeah, so <laughs> it's let go of the things more often than what you used to. Uh, don't pick on petty things and. Right. So it, it does help for sure. Um, the problem is the alarm goes off and it's going to, you know, go, go, go. Right. You know? Right. So, right. You so you know, do you have to set it up. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Then uh, you sacrifice sleep. Right. You know, it, so right. it's hard to reconcile something. Right. Like I said, in the summer it is easier because kids are on their own schedule. They don't have to be waking up at 6.30 to go to school. You know, my high schooler, her bus comes at 6.30, right? So she has to wake up at 5.15. Mm-hmm. So we generally wake up at 5.30 and do this thing, this Kriya. Uh, we have to dial it back to five to make it happen. So mm-hmm. it's gonna be a little harder, but you do have to pick and choose, like I said, right. you know? And on certain days, you will miss it. You miss it, you miss it, so be it. Next day will be a new day. So we try that and we're supposed to do it for 40 straight days, need about 32 out of 40. Mm-hmm. A um, couple of days we miss, few days we miss, but it becomes a habit. Mm-hmm. So instead of doing, uh, we used to do some exercise, some yoga and this, we do right now this one only. Mm-hmm. Um, the exercise wise, we started swimming for ourselves. Mm-hmm. So we both go together for swimming um, twice a week. So that helps us on the exercise side. So tell me about the tangible benefits that you have experienced. Um, honestly, in I could say that the home, like I said, the kids can see that, uh, the difference on that. But for me personally, uh, the stressful life I had in the office mm-hmm. has become really stable. 
Mm-hmm. In other words, you know, he's always frustrated, always anxious about certain things that doesn't go on your own way. Um, now you can actually pick and choose and say, you know what, that's just part of it. Right. Um, the decisions you take in office are much, uh, I would say, much conscious and reliable decisions mm-hmm. compared to what we, it was before. Okay. Uh, or at least I could see that difference. Um, and at home, like I said, that it's uh, more with the kids and more with what you do with them when they are not following your instructions. Right. Period. So those are the things that I see it's quite beneficial. Right. And the reason that doing it in the morning is preferred is because you can then let that influence the rest of your day. Yes, yes, if you that. do it at night, well, then you go to sleep and then it doesn't influence the next day. There's right. no carryover benefits. Right. right. <laughs> and in, right. in few days, are in a way that it is so, so like uh, there's no thought at all. You feel like, like what's going on? You feel something uneasy because you don't see, you don't feel any thoughts. You do not right. have any thoughts when you have done proper kriyas. Um, and it is combination of yoga and, and the kriya. So, yeah, we do see a very benefit of that. So a great time to practice what we practice here about this focus, about stepping back your mental awareness outside of your brain, is I do it in the morning. Because in the morning, it's like all routine, what I have to do. I've done it a million times, and my body knows what to do, right? So you just step back and you say, well, isn't it interesting? You know, or create some kind of mantra for yourself, right? Isn't it interesting that I'm getting signals from my eyes and my body's doing this and it's all going on auto and I'm not thinking about that, I'm not thinking about it, I'm just monitoring everything that I'm doing. And then sometimes, of course, you want to do that, you want to let that influence your whole life, you know, so right in here I'm talking to you and I'm doing that right now, you know, and I find myself talking to people and um, doing that right now, it's, you know, maybe they see it in me, maybe they see I'm a little different or maybe they see I'm a little weird or something like that, but uh, you try and make it so that your whole life is doing that. And um, I guarantee you then that will allow you to focus on the things that you want to because I remember saying this last year to you guys, but it bears repeating that mantras work, okay? Mantras work and it's not magic. Okay, it is mindfulness. So when somebody has a mantra, let's say they say, I want, to, I want to be a millionaire in one year. And they repeat that, so repeat that to themselves for five times in the morning. It will work. Okay, why will it work? Because they started it in the morning and they let it affect their decisions throughout the day. That means when they get off work and they have this networking event, that means they go, they decide to go instead of going back home because it's in the front of their mind that they want to be a millionaire. You know, that means when they have an investment opportunity, that's a risk. Instead of saying, well, I don't want to do that, maybe they're more inclined to take a risk because they have it in front of their mind, okay? So mantras work and it's not about magic, it's about mindfulness. (laughs) What technique of meditation do you use? So my meditation is monitoring thoughts as they arise um, and letting them go right. and focusing on the breath. Uh, it started out as just focusing on the breath and not right. trying to think of anything. Right. And I got really good at that, but there was a problem in that my breaths are too far apart. Where that, you know, they say focus on in and right. focus on out. Correct. But between in and out, there are two stages when it's in and you're holding it. And then when it's out and you're holding it, and then you have thoughts too much it. time. Okay. And then I have thoughts. Right. And well, I'm supposed to focus on my breath, but nothing's happening. Right. You wanna you wanna see how an example of how it is? I can try to relax myself, okay? And you'll see how far apart they are. Okay, so especially with the out, between out and in, right. it's too much time for me to sure. not, right. to try to I focus, I can't focus on anything. Right. Right? So, I, so I stopped that, stopped the breath. That's what I, everybody recommends you start with. And then I started this monitoring of the thoughts, this 
What are you feeling? What signals are being sent to your brain? Are you letting your attention be arrested by those thoughts? And if so, why? And then you will find yourself wandering, you know. There's this kind of anecdote. So then you actually focus more on those thoughts because you're, uh, you're, you're recognizing those thoughts. But then right. I'm trying and then to I'm trying to let it go. Right. I'm trying to do the exercise of letting them go. Okay, okay so um, there's, this folk, there's this story um, that people tell that is this person um, went to this retreat, this meditation retreat. And they were, you know, and how it works is you have five minutes with the teacher to talk about what they did that day and you're in a line, right? So he sees the next person in line and he's a new person. He says, oh yeah, I was able to focus on my breath for five or ten minutes, you know, and then I got distracted and then I got back. And then the senior people laugh to themselves because they, if you're new, you can't do that for five or ten minutes. You can't do that for three breaths in a row. You can't focus on your breath right. without being arrested by your thoughts. Right. And then the person came back after two weeks and said, oh, I was able to focus on my breath for one minute, you know, and then, and then he came back after a month or two months, oh, you know, I was able to focus on my breath for 10 seconds before I got distracted, you know, so, so that's what this thing is, is that's what this, this whole thing is, and there are different kinds of meditation, um, and then you should kind of research and see what's sure. interesting for you, um, but I had to let go of the, the breath you. one and, and do okay. kind of a different one. Any other thoughts or comments on today's? So I, what I want you to take away is that the thoughts that thoughts will think themselves with or without you. You have no control. You have no responsibility over the contents of your thoughts. Only which ones you pay attention to.